We've been talking about the armor of God, and this particular sermon series is coming to an end. Okay, so I'm sure you're all happy about that, right? So um, the, the scripture tells us that, you know, whether we like it or not, our enemy, the devil, will attack us. And uh, we will need to be ready. And if we need to be ready, we need to, we need to have all the protection that we can get. So over here, the scripture tells us to put on the full armor of God. F-U-L-L. -L, all of it. Full armor of God. <clears throat> um, just a quick refresher. The spiritual armor belongs to us. It's God's gift. We can choose to put it on. Put on none of it. And uh, I, I call this level zero because you don't have to put on anything. You're born with this. And the next level is level one. We could put on some of it. In this picture, of course, uh, the X means no helmet. Um, but to put on the sum of it, the first package is your belt of truth, <coughs> breastplate of righteousness, and the sandals of the gospel. Okay. So this is level one. It gives us uh, basic protection. Um, it's the first three pieces of the armor mentioned in Ephesians 6. The next level, I call this level two, uh, it gives us advanced protection. And this is where our sermon series is at right now. And we're almost done. Okay. And then the, the level after this, I call it the ultimate level, level three. And it says here that... Uh, in, in, in the scripture, it tells us if we put on the full armor of God and pray in the spirit, that, that I would consider the ultimate package, the ultimate armor. Okay, so I know some of you who have not heard it before, it might be a little bit confusing. So if you missed any of it and want a refresher, just go to our Facebook. Type in Chinese American Family Bible Church. And then you can find the links to the previous sermons there. Okay, so let's proceed. <clears throat> so the Bible tells us in addition, so in addition to the first three pieces, in addition, it says to take up the shield of faith, which you can ex extinguish all flaming arrows of the evil one. Okay, and then take up the helmet of salvation. And then the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Okay, so, so this is the, the, the part I said that, that's a little bit more advanced. So immediately we want to go right into it. Uh, when we're thinking about the helmet of salvation, we want to know not exactly what a helmet is. Everybody knows what a helmet is. But we want to know more about the salvation part. Okay, so what is salvation? And then, how do I put on salvation like, like an armor? And then lastly, of course, how does salvation help me? Okay, if, if that's supposed to protect us. All right. <clears throat> so, salvation to the Jews, uh, well, salvation itself, salvation itself is uh, really not a hard concept to understand. Right? If... If you are on a ship and uh, you're stuck and maybe you, you are tipping over and you cannot move, what you're going to do usually is radio out for help. And you're going to say, SOS, save our, save our soul, mayday, mayday. You know, you're going to call for help. And whoever ships nearby that comes to help, well, that, they're your salvation. They're the people who's going to save you from this trouble. If nobody shows up, that's going to be, be, be really bad because you'll probably be dead if nobody comes to help. Okay, so the idea of salvation is not a hard concept to grasp. It's the way that we use it as Christians that might be a little bit different. So we're going to go into that. <clears throat> so um, starting from way back, uh, looking in the Old Testament, Okay. Going to the earliest of human history, we can see that God is a God of, he's, he's a savior God. 
Okay, so there's no time to go through every example of what happened. But let me just touch on some of the most famous ones that we probably know of, starting with Adam and Eve. Well, they sinned. And immediately when they sinned, God is already planning how to save them and how to save their children. And the children, their children is us. Okay, so God is already ready to save. And then we got Noah. We know that Noah saved, I mean, God saved a people, Noah's family, and then a whole bunch of animals, okay, from destruction. And then later on, there's Moses. God saved the children of Israel who, was, who became slaves for, their, for the Egyptians. And the Egyptian master are torturing them. And they were crying out to God. So God saved the Israelites through Moses. And then there's Samson. God gave him supernatural strength. And his, his job was God is saving Israel through Samson by, you know, attack, by, by the people who are attacking and he's defending the Israelites from the attack. Okay, then you've got David, King David. God raised him up as a king to save Israel from the Philistines. Oh, remember David and Goliath, right? And then we have the prophets. God kept sending the prophets to God's people because he wants to tell them, here's the instructions. This is what you should do, and you will be saved. And if you don't do that, then I'm going to pull back from blessing you, and you might get hurt from all the other people around you. Okay? So we see all these examples of God being a savior. But we also see that in most of the New Testament, the idea, the idea of salvation is mostly from physical death or harm by other human behavior, like wars, okay? But when Jesus came, he didn't emphasize that as much. He emphasized not so much on the physical salvation, but he changed that topic a little bit. He now, he now is talking about more of salvation from eternal or spiritual death, okay? So this also explains why the, the Jewish people had a hard time accepting Jesus as the Messiah. Because when Jesus came, if he was the Messiah, the Jewish people expected him to save them from the Romans. And of course, he wasn't interested about saving them from the Romans. He was more interested about saving them from hell. Okay? All right, so... <clears throat> We see, I, I just gave you a run, rundown a little bit from, the, uh, from Adam and Eve. That's, that's as far as we can go, right? The very beginning. So I gave you a little bit of a rundown of God's Word. We see that God's Word has 66 books that we call the Bible. And we also see that throughout this whole entire 66 books combined into one Bible, one thing that runs through the whole entire book is the theme of salvation, saving, God being a Savior. We can see it throughout all these books that God is a God who is interested in saving his creation. Okay? So the Bible contains revelations of God. Those revelations of God are spiritual truth. And one of these truths is that God is demonstrating in the Old Testament that he is a God who can save and does save. Right? We saw all these examples in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus came and he revealed to us that God want us to, want to, wants to save not just the Jews, his chosen people, but also he's, he's not interested in just saving the Jews from, from their enemies, but he wants to save everybody, right? All of us. And he wants to save us from our eternal damnation. Okay, so that's some of the truth in the Bible. Um, 1 Timothy 2, 3, 3 to 6, it tells us that this is good and pleasing, that God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay, so we got salvation, we got truth, and we got the word. Now, what is that truth in this particular scripture? Well, let's continue. So here's the truth. The truth is that there is one God, one mediator between God and mankind, 
the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Okay, that's the truth. So <clears throat> we see that the truth that God revealed about salvation is demonstrated in the Old Testament. Then the Isaiah, then Isaiah prof prophesied about a Messiah. And the, when the Messiah came, he redeemed, the, the Messiah will redeem us from our sin. And all we have to do is what? All we have to do is believe and repent, and then we will be saved. You know, that, that's the simple message. That's the good news. And that, that's what we call the gospel, good news. Okay? So a perfect example of this can be found in Acts. Acts 2, 36 to 40. Okay, this is where Peter is explaining to uh, both Jews and the people who are not Jews, who are the Gentiles, but they converted over to Judaism. And both group of people, the Jews and the, the believing non-Jews, they came together to celebrate Pentecost. Remember that? Uh, they were thinking because they were speaking in other languages that they were drunk. Remember that, that story? So anyway, Peter started to explain to them. Peter started to explain to, to them from the Old Testament prophecies. And he made this conclusion. And he said, what did he say? Hmm. This is what he said, right? He, he made this conclusion that therefore let all Israel be assured of this, that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Okay? So people believed when, when he explained all this and came to this conclusion, when he was explaining all these prophecies, the people who were listening, they believed. Okay? They believed. And the sensation of that believing was like the words that Peter was talking about. It was cutting into their hearts. Right? It says right here, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And then he, they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? So, so they were so moved by what Peter is saying, they, they, they actually believed their message, and they said, we've got to do something to, to make this right. So you see that they're believing, and they want to take some action. And the script, scripture continues says that uh, Peter replied, what do you have to do? You have to repent. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And let's keep going. The promise is for you, all who you are listening, and your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. So not just to the listeners, but also to their children, but to their children's children, including us, who are far off. We weren't on the scene, but that includes us. And let's continue. So with many words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, and he says, save yourselves. There's that salvation. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So you see the salvation is, yes, saving us so that we could go to heaven, saving us from hell, but saving us also from this corrupt generation. If you don't get saved, you will continue to be corrupted just as everybody is, right? Because the more evil there are, the more influential it is, and then the more things are getting corrupted. So we need to turn from that. And the only way to really turn is to turn to our Savior who knows the ultimate truth and what is right. Okay, so we see this be, uh, in the previ previous sermon. that the, There's an idea. The idea is supported by evidence or experience. And then there's faith. Okay? So... <clears throat> Sometimes, sometimes this experience or evidence will grow the faith. 
because you know that it's true, then you, you, you have faith and then you believe it. But sometimes in the matter of salvation and God's revelations, sometimes God himself will give you the gift of faith. There, there are scriptures in the Bible that talks about the gift of faith. So some people, they might not figure it out. They cannot understand it. But somehow God gave them that faith and they still want to believe. So they believe first and understand later. Some people need to understand first and believe, right? But some other people, they actually believe first and figure it out later. So that's the gift of faith. But no matter, what, what matter is that they believed and then there's action that followed that ended in some kind of result. Okay, so the people who are listening to Peter that day, they believed. And one of the first things that they want to do is they want to get baptized. Okay, that's, that's, that's their response. So we also see this graph before that in Romans 1.16, we see that the, the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. That's what Romans 1.16 says, and we see that at work. Okay, so people must have faith and believe the gospel, but they also need to have righteousness. So Romans 1.17 says this, For the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the faith that the righteous will live by faith. Well, what in the world does that mean? Okay, so this, this is how I see this works. We talked about righteousness before. Righteousness, is, of course, is just to live justly, right? The opposite of righteousness is sin. So if you live sinlessly or without sin, then you're living righteously. If you live according to what God says, this is what you should do, then you're living righteously. If you're living in a way that God says, don't do this, and yet you do it, then you're not, then you're sinning. Okay, so this is how I see this working. I see that here, um, righteousness, of course, like I said, is opposite of sin. And when there's no sin, then there's no wall. There's no wall that, no wall that separates us from God. So we've got total access. When there's no uh, sin, there's no blocking our access to God. So in Isaiah 56, 2 to, 4, 2 to 4, it says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities, the, all the stuff that you sin, your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sin have hidden you, hidden you from his face so that he will not hear. That's what's blocking our access. For your hands have stained, are stained with blood. Your fingers are stained with guilt. Your lips are spoken, speaking falsely. Your tongue mutter wicked things. No one calls for justice. No one pleads a case of integrity. So, so Isaiah, of course, is, is describing what's blocking us from God. It's sin. Okay? So no sin, you get access. But when there is sin... There's no access. And none of us, none of us are without sin. We are all separated from God. And some of us, we consider that our sins are, uh, eh, a little bit. Just, just sin a little bit. You know, we, we're not bad guys. We're okay, you know. So we don't think of our sins as, you know, really bad. But it doesn't matter. As long as there's sin, we're separated from God. God is all pure. And he does not want any sin. So as long as there's sin, no matter how little, we're separated from God. So even if you consider yourself with eh, just a little bit of sin, still you are blocked. Okay? But then there are others. A lot of sin. They actually pride themselves in sinning. They're like, come on, sin with me. Sinning is good. You know? So a lot of sin. And they know it. Okay? So some of us have a lot of sin, even bad sin. 
And some of us, at some point in our lives, well, we decided, hmm, maybe I should stop that because it's not doing me any good. Maybe I should start living, living right, stop sinning, doing the things that I'm supposed to do rather than the things that I'm not supposed to do. So then they, they even, you know, try to clean up their life and maybe even volunteer to help people in need. But all the good that they do, that doesn't clear up the sins that's already committed. It, it's not like an eraser. When you do good things, you start erasing your sin. It's not like that. Your sin is still your sin. Your righteousness, of course, yes, is your righteousness. You did good things. God says, I'm going to reward those who, do, who, who does righteousness. But it doesn't, it doesn't erase each other out. Just because you did righteousness doesn't mean that you erased sin. Okay? So, have you ever had a, a dirty rag? Dirty rag that maybe, maybe like this one, that maybe you use to clean your car with, or work on the engine with, uh, or do gardening with, or just wipe the floor with. You know, and we, we all have those rags, right, that we kind of don't want anymore, that we use for those kind of junky purposes. So can you imagine this, this is all filthy, and then uh, I'm going to wash it. And after I wash it, I'm going to use it to, this to dry myself in the, after I take a shower. I don't think so, right? I don't think you would either, right? And some of us might go as far as bleaching it, trying to get it all new again. But some, sometimes these rags, no matter, even, even if you put bleach, it doesn't come back as new, and you don't want to use it to dry yourself with it. You're still just like, oh, okay, I tried. I tried to make it new again. I tried to make it look nice, but it's just some, some weird things that won't come out. Okay? So the Bible actually tells us that in Isaiah 64, 6, that all of us who have become like that, unclean, and even if, our, if we start to do righteousness, our righteous acts are like filthy rags. That's what Isaiah 64, 6 says. And in Romans 6.23, it teaches us that the consequences of sin is that sinning, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Okay? So you see that, you see that in Romans, that this is actually only it only works as a gift. There's no way that we could actually do enough righteousness to overcome the sin. Okay? And the only way to receive that gift is by believing in Jesus as our Lord and Savior and then repent. Okay? So when you actually believed, naturally you want to be baptized and naturally you want to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's, that's in essence believing. Right? When you believe something, you're going to say, well, I believe it, so I'm going to do it. You, some, some, some people get this idea that I believe, but I'm still going to do the opposite. And then you didn't really believe. Right? If I believe that this is really bad for me, like this asset is going to kill me, I'm going to say I believe that if I drink it, my lungs and everything will just burn up. And I'm drinking it any, anyway? Well, then I didn't believe that. Right? But if I actually believed it and I said, oh, no way. Let, let me seal it all up and protect it from somebody else. Then yes, I always say yes, you, you actually believed. So anyway, when we believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, naturally we want to do what he wants us to do, which is first thing, get baptized and then confess that Jesus is actually our Lord and Savior. That, that's the beginning of that belief. And then the second thing is repent. So when we repent, naturally we will stop sinning and start living a righteous life, right? Repent, like we said before, is to be sorry for the sins that we have committed and then turn from the way we're going to God's way. That's repent. And I, I like the Chinese uh, 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 word for those, is hui gai. It actually has a turnaround in there, okay? Like hou hui would be, uh, I regret it, and then gai would be actually to change. So I, I like the Chinese for that. That, that translation, okay? All right, so <clears throat> when we do this, something awesome happens. That according to 2 Corinthians 5.21, Jesus actually exchanged our sin with his righteousness. 
Jesus, who has no sin, exchanged his no sinness, his righteousness, with our sin. That's, that's pretty awesome. So you see, when we have no sin, that wall came down. Now we have access. In Romans 5, 1 to 2, we're told that we can gain access again, but not because we are righteous, but because Jesus was righteous. And we became righteous because we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So in this way, we are made righteous, not by what we do, but by our, by our faith. So salvation is by faith, not by works. But don't get me wrong, after you believe, there should be works to prove that you actually did believe. Okay, it's, it's not, okay, I believe, okay, I'm going to heaven, let me continue to sin. You don't get a free license to sin just because you believed. Okay, all right. So now, this is the picture. So here's another picture of the armor of God. You see, everything hooks up with the helmet of salvation. So if you must wear just only one piece of the armor, I would suggest you wear the helmet of salvation. Because the Bible tells us in Mark 8.36, it says, what good is it that you gain the whole entire world, but you lose your soul? So how do you put on this helmet of salvation? I just told you, right? I hope you remember. It's by believing in Jesus as our Lord and Savior and repent of our sins and live righteously afterwards. Okay? So you see, you see this is beginning to make sense. It all wraps around and it's all connected. All right, so then the next thing is, well, how, how does... How does salvation protect us? Um, have you guys all seen this movie called Castaway? By Tom Hanks? Yes? Okay, good. A lot of nods. Okay, so what happened in the movie is basically this guy works for FedEx. His name is Chuck. And then he was flying somewhere, I don't know where, uh, the plane crashed in the ocean. And he was the only survivor. And he ended up in this remote, deserted island all by himself. Okay, there's no, no other people. All right? So, of course, he went from looking like that to looking like this. Okay, in the island. And uh, he was kind of chubby in the beginning of the movie, got kind of skinny at the end. All right? But what kept him going? What kept him going? I mean, a lot of people would just give up, like, what do I do? But he, he kept going. He was figuring out how to get the crabs and make a spear to get the fish. And I mean, he was trying to survive. He was trying to get the coconuts. And then he needed somebody to talk to, so he made his volleyball <laughs> Wilson so he could talk to somebody, right? But he kept going. He kept going. He didn't give up. Why? There's one thing that kept him going. It was his fiance. Remember he had a picture? I think uh, her name was Kelly in the movie. So he had, he had her picture. And that's what kept him going. Okay? So that's kind of like salvation. We, we got to know, we got to realize that salvation is our destiny. There's all going to be all kinds of things that goes wrong on earth. Because evil's here. Sin is here. Not everybody is living righteous life. Okay? But we need to keep going. We know this earth is only a temporary place for us, a temporary home. Our ultimate home is in heaven. So that's how it protects us. It protects us by keeping us in the straight and narrow so that we can keep going, aim, aiming for the destination. You know, some, most of us, I guess, uh, we all have some kind of school, and some of us have college. But I remember when I was in college, things got hard. Subjects got hard, making friends got hard, there was no, no support around that got hard. But what kept me through in getting that degree was thinking, man, if I get this degree, one day I'm going to become an engineer or whatever I was dreaming of back then. But it was that looking for the, the final destination that kept me going. And I'm sure all, all of you have some experience like this. I mean, remember going on long journeys? And maybe, uh, maybe your kids are fussing in the back or whatever, and you're like, 
It's going to be over soon. It's going to be over soon. Let me keep going. We're almost home. Or even flying from here to Taiwan or some China. It takes a long time, but you're like, we're almost there. We're almost there. You know, you just like keep going. So we got to think of this as how salvation protects us. In salvation, remember the scripture we just read, it also saves us from this corrupt generation. So salvation, it's not just an eternity, eternity thing. It starts now. As soon as you believe, it starts to change. So, you know, there's a lot of people who says, well, you know, I want to party for now. I want to do all my crazy stuff right now. So when I get older, by the time I'm dying, that's when I'm going to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior so I could get my ticket into heaven. Well, then you just wasted all those time that you could have lived a righteous life and gained reward and God, you know, communion with you and guiding you and stuff like that because you're like, oh, no, not right now, God. You know, you wasted all that time. So salvation is not just for later. It starts at this moment when we decide. Okay? All right. So hopefully that gives us a little bit of idea of what salvation is. And we can see how this whole armor of God connects together in the center of this is the helmet of salvation. And we all know, you know, when we go somewhere, if we need to protect ourselves, usually the first thing we put on is a helmet. Like I was saying before, like when you go snow skiing, when you go riding your motorcycle, your bicycle, I mean, all kind of dangerous sports, the first thing you want to put on is your helmet, right? So here, like I said, if you just can only choose one, put on the helmet of salvation. But I would, of course, advise, just like the scripture says, put on the full entire armor of God, not just the helmet of salvation, okay? All right, so that's the word for the day. Uh, may those who have ears, let them hear, and let's stand for the benediction. All right, let's bow. Lord God, help us. Help us to realize how great a sacrifice you have made for our salvation. Help us, Lord, to constantly remember that this is not our final destination. We are just passing through. Lord, bless us with courage and endurance. Bless us with love for one another. Bless us with health and vitality. Lord, help us to be your ambassadors. Glory to God in the highest. May your name be blessed forever and ever. Amen.